Good evening and welcome to Big Tent Live Events, our live online event series from the University of Oxford as part of the Humanities Cultural Programme, one of the founding stones for the future Stephen A. Schwartzman Centre for the Humanities. My name, as regulars will know, is Wes Williams and I'm the director here at Torch. We bring you this event online and hope that you remain safe and well. Everyone is welcome in our big tent as we explore big ideas together here. I'd like to remind you that you can submit questions and comments for our speakers. Please type these into the YouTube live chat below and we'll answer as many as possible later in the session when I come back. Tonight then we're delighted to bring you this uh, a discussion of this book, Under the Rainbow, Voices from Lockdown. And the discussion is with the author, uh, James uh, Attlee, who I'll introduce uh, in a moment. The event we're doing in collaboration with Blackwells of Oxford, um, and if you want your own signed copy of this book, do look on the website where you've got the phone number for Blackwells. They will, uh, A, send it to you if you live outside Oxford. If not, then they will even bring it to you by bike, uh, uh, if, as long as you live within the Oxford Ring Road. Otherwise, you can place an order online at blackwells.co.uk. Um, James, then. I have, first of all, then, the honour of introducing James Attlee, who I hope will come to your screen in a minute. James Attlee is the author of Under the Rainbow. Hello, James. Um, Voices from Lockdown. He's also written uh, Isolarian, A Different Oxford Journey, Guernica, Painting the End of the World, Station to Station, when he was the, what was it, uh, writer in residence on the Great Western Railway, if I remember rightly. Um, that it, book was shortlisted for the Stanford Dolman Travel Book of the Year 2017. He's also written Nocturne, A Journey in Search of Moonlight, amongst other titles. His digital fiction, The Cartographer's Confession, won the 2017 New Media Writing Prize. He works as an editor, lecturer, and publishing consultant, and his journalism has appeared in publications including The Independence, Tate, etc., Freeze, and the London Review of Books. Welcome, James. It's very nice to have you here in the big tent. I'm also delighted to welcome Marina Warner this evening. I'll wait till Marina comes on screen. Hello, Marina. Marina Hello. Warner is an acclaimed polymath, a writer of fiction, criticism, history, and mythography. Her works include novels, short stories, as well as studies of art, myths, symbols, and fairy tales. And certainly in my working life, she's been an inspiration in many ways. She's written for many publications, from the London Review of Books through to the New Statesman and to Vogue, and is a distinguished fellow of All Souls Oxford. Not many people have managed to combine those two uh, qualities. Um, welcome, Marina. Thank you. And last but no means least, we welcome Professor Pablo Mukherjee. Again, I'll wait till Pablo comes to the screen. Hey, Hello, was... Pablo. Professor Pablo Mukherjee teaches on the English and Comparative Literary Studies program at Warwick University and is an expert on Victorian as well as contemporary imperial, colonial and anti-imperial colonial cultures. He's uh, got a good degree of expertise then in uh, Victorian and, and indeed some degree of contemporary writing. He also happens to live in Oxford and so has um, some thoughts to, to, to bring to our discussion around uh, this book, um, which as readers will know is partly based in Oxford, but not only about Oxford. And that I dare say is one of the things we'll be discussing um, in the course of today's conversation. Um, welcome Pablo um, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm now going to disappear from the screens whilst the three of our speakers, um, our guests, have a discussion. I think we're going to start really with a discussion between Marina and James and then move on to more of a discussion between James and Pablo, but they'll all stay present. And then I will join you again later on uh, in about half an hour or so um, uh, to try and animate things between all three of you and also to bring in at that stage questions from uh, the audience. So um, before you go, did oh, you? Oh, I'm very sorry. You're quite right. I've forgotten about this. Really, thank you very much, James. So one of the great things about this book um, is, uh, apart from the writing, um, is that there are some really lovely, um, and not just lovely, but kind of uh, challenging, interesting, uh, rich photographs and images in here. So Maya is going to show us a few of them. It's about rainbows in windows. And so here then are uh, one or two um, photographs. Thank you. So this one combining uh, the rainbow with a Black Lives Matter image. 
and this uh, there's a rainbow with an England uh, football flag. And here's the rainbow rocket. I think, is that the wrong way around? Should that, in fact, be <coughs> a, door, a door going upwards, James? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, there we are. It's a sideways rocket for now. Um, uh, and we can imagine it going the other way. Um, thank you for reminding me. Um, and uh, at that stage, I really will disappear and leave you guys to get on with the conversation and look forward to listening and joining in later. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, Wes wanted me to begin by just reading a short extract. Um, so this is taken from close to the beginning of the book when I'm first um, venturing out into the city, um, exploring, uh, exploring it and using uh, the art in people's windows as an excuse to ring their doorbells and try and start a conversation. Back on the bike, up the hill that always gets the heart going, slow down on a street of Edwardian terraces. I knock on a door next to a window decorated with a hand-drawn rainbow. It's opened by a woman, a girl of five or six, peering out from behind her. I ask, who did the picture and why? Oh, my daughter, the woman says. Then to the girl, do you want to tell the man why you did it? The girl picks up her mother's dress and hides her face in it. Because you told me to, she says in a muffled voice. This, it turns out, is a recurrent theme. A serious-faced man opens a door a little further along. His children are there somewhere in the background, but they're not invited to join our conversation. Why did his family create the artwork in their window? It was a way of being able to express support to health workers and also an activity that got the children involved, stopped them getting bored, he tells me. So partly it was for something to do, but also so the children would understand the impact of the crisis, appreciate what the health workers are doing, having, have a sense of what's at stake. No danger that education is on hold in this house during lockdown. The rainbow artwork suddenly feel less spontaneous, more a task that has been set. I move on through sun-baked streets I know would have been decorated with artworks just two months ago, but are now a gallery scrubbed clean. Builders are busy on scaffolding, fixing roofs, giving houses a post-pandemic paint job, their conversations providing a quasi-divine commentary from above, gruff cherubim in a Renaissance painting. I've developed a cycling technique that involves pedaling slowly while moving my head from side to side to scan each property from behind dark glasses. It provokes some suspicious looks for understandable reasons. Thank you so much, James. Um, I must say, I feel that you've written in a very provocative book, um, absolutely full of thought about the current crisis we're in, but all, and a very perceptive book with of infinite powers of attention, the quality of attention and listening that you show to your interlocutors and to these, some of many of them strangers to you, is very, very striking in the book. But as you mentioned there, you know, you, people could have been suspicious. So I'm interested about your, you know, your method, because it seems to me that you're in a literary tradition, even though you're not being self-conscious about it, but you're in a literary tradition which runs definitely back to Orwell, at least, um, of documentary witness, testimony, gathering voices, but also a kind of situationist, a situationist attitude of the chance encounter. The, and I'm amazed you didn't have more trouble, as it were, as you <laughs> charged into people's lives. Yes, I, I kind of, I reckon sometimes I had about five seconds uh, when someone opened the door um, to engage with them um, and quite often uh, children played a role in um, getting me past that initial suspicion I mean because let's face it when people strangers ring your doorbell they could be coming for the rent they could be causing trouble they could be anybody you know and so I had did have one you know one or two occasions where someone would open the door and sort of say what do you want you know in quite an aggressive way and then if I was able to say, well, I just saw that beautiful rainbow in your window and I wondered who did it, then they'd say, oh, that's my son, I'll, I'll get him for you. And the children have this kind of magical role um, in diffusing suspicion. Um, yeah, but as you say, 
I think probably what I've learned, uh, if anything, from the situationist is that thing of being open to chance and to being sensitive to the kind of psychic atmosphere of different parts of the city and being alert for that sort of what somebody's called the dog whistle of chance, you know, that will just make you think, oh, I'll just go down that street, I'll just turn here. Um, and there was a sense of urgency as I tried to explain in that extract that a lot of people were taking the art down by the end of lockdown because it was fading. Um, their children had moved on to other things and so on. Um, yeah, so I, I think, I'm sure I've learned a lot from the situationist, but it's all just part of my DNA now, yeah, you yeah. know, after a long time. But I, I think just through doing a number of books where I've kind of wandered about and spoken to people um, and met people, I just, when I go into the zone, I, I'm, I just feel very relaxed. And I think people read your body language. Um, and they know it was almost as if they'd been waiting for me. Some of these people, they had a lot of pent up emotion, they, the things they wanted to say. And it was almost as if I was the recycling uh, guys coming to pick up the recycling, you know, oh, here's the story collector, you know, and people, yeah, quite yes. matter of fact, they quite understood the idea. Yes, you want to hear our stories about this strange time. Yes, I think that you catch that very well. It, your finger is very much on that pulse. The people are cooped up. They, they haven't been allowed to touch or see other people. And suddenly they are allowed to speak. But you have a very vivid cast of characters. And I wondered if you did actually consciously think, I must do this, I must cover that, I must. You have a very vigorous landlady, pub landlady. You have a, the a supermarket attendant. You have many medical people several ages of children. I mean, it's a marvellous ga gallery. Well, not, I shouldn't say gallery, a marvellous actual chorus of voices. And that reminded me of a very great contemporary writer who is Svetlana Alexeyevich. And your book has something in common with her book on Chernobyl, right. which, which, which is called in English Chernobyl. Chernobyl Prayer, in which she gathers these voices of people who have lived through that. Of course, we're still living through the virus at the moment, so. Yeah, we are. I mean, it was, as you've sort of, I, I think, guessed, it was a mixture of chance encounters and then me thinking it would be great to find someone, you know, a, a, a nurse, for instance, who could really um, tell me, you know, what she um, experienced uh, during the first um, lockdown. And you know, when I heard that somebody knew somebody whose parent was in a care home and was um, infected with COVID really because somebody had been released from mm. hospital with it um, mm. on the very day that supposedly a ring had been put around um, by care homes, uh, they found out that actually the hospital was had been told to send people back, it appears, in, in the book. Um, from her testimony. Um, so, I, of course, I did seek out particular people. And I also have many conversations that don't appear in the book because they were too like others or they were unremarkable, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a mixture of those, those yeah. things. And I did sort of feel a bit like sort of Studs Turkle lugging a big, great big kind of reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder around Chicago and I felt quite grateful that now you can just float like a leaf on the current with a with an iPhone and you've you've got it covered. And then of course the thread that you so wonderfully noted is the symbol of the rainbow um, mm -hmm. and you treat it very you know with great respect every artifact is you treat it with great respect and you actually unfold a story uh, very unexpectedly to me of the changing meanings in real time of a symbol. Yes, I, I, I did kind of think, where the hell did all these rainbows come from, you know? And um, it appears that the symbol first appeared in Italy uh, during lockdown, together with the um, phrase, and andra tutto bene, you know, everything's gonna be all right. Um, but also one has to remember that 
um, Italy is the sort of power center of Catholicism. So inevitably the rainbow symbol is, is um, inflected also with the biblical mm -hmm. uh, overtones of the rainbow during Noah's flood. And um, of course, in, on that occasion, uh, God told uh, Noah that he was going to destroy all living things on earth and that Noah should get on board the boat that he built together with his family and two of every living thing and just wait for the destruction of everything, everything else. And at the end of the flood, the rainbow appears as a promise, mm -hmm. like, OK, you've got through that. I'm never going to do that again. So in that way, it's a, the rainbow uh posters i think in italy were saying like if we get through this global catastrophe that's like a great flood um everything will be fine uh, again so it came then to spain and then it came to england and to start with again it had just this simple positive message to it um but it quickly became uh symbolic of the nhs and i wondered how that had happened and i traced that back to um, 2018 when a report came out that said that a lot of LGBTQIA people had ex experienced prejudice when getting help from the NHS. And a particular hospital, the London Children's Hospital, the Evelina Hospital, decided to make rainbow badges for their staff to show their hospital was an inclusive safe space for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that spread throughout the NHS. The health secretary took to wearing one in his lapel. And so in the, in the minds of the public, I think the two symbols got conflated. But of course, that rainbow badge was a symbol of pride, um, mm. you know, and knowingly used in that way by the NHS to start with, and uh, of gay, you know, the gay pride. And so I speak, I have a, a good conversation with, with an artist who, who explains how the community felt though, as though the symbol had been stolen from them without permission and changed into something else and even used for government propaganda. So that was really the story of its mutation in real time before our eyes, as it were. Yes, it was fascinating, but you also very perceptively remark that it became children putting it up were actually putting it up as a protective symbol. It becomes rather like the hand of Fatima or, or the eye against the evil eye. Exactly. Um, often if I rang a doorbell and an, an older person might emerge, a, a sort of grandparent figure, and it would turn out that a child had sent them that because they were no longer allowed to visit. Mm -hmm. So they would send rainbows through the post or pop through the door or whatever. Um, and it was to protect that loved person mm -hmm. and to prevent the plague from entering. Yes. Uh, the building as it were so yeah. again I, I was reminded of the handprints that are found in um, caves where children have apparently been lifted up to place their mm -hmm. handprints high up on the walls of caves and these are not just children being entertained during a lockdown <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're children that are invested with kind of power by the tribe and they have a, a role mm -hmm. and I think children did have a very big role during lockdown and, and families in an unaccustomed way lived together for, for a long period of time. You have another theme which is very, very interesting. I know Pablo wants to come in on this, but I just ask you one thing first, is that these messages are, as you've just said, personal messages. This, this is a card sent to a, to a granny, but the granny doesn't usually put a birthday card in the window. So this is a way of speaking from the private sphere, the domestic sphere, where we were all locked in, to into the street. And you then relate the rainbow, these, these rainbow messages to the whole history of graffiti and protests and banners and making a statement um, in the free, the still free area of the public forum. I mean, things were happening in the world. Um, the death of <coughs> Floyd, um, the cancellation of World, um, you know, Earth Day. Um, yeah, so people had a lot of concerns and also about the way the uh, pandemic was being handled. 
and um, they couldn't meet with people face to face. So this was a way, it was like going an alternative to social media where we're all talking to our own bubble, as it were. People were putting them in the window and making a statement mm -hmm. of their position to the street. Mm -hmm. And it might be a statement of solidarity or protest or whatever. And, the, and other messages were, I think, were sort of wrapped up in these rainbows. So Pablo, I think over to you. Yeah, thanks, Marina. And thank you for, um, for raising that point about chance. What I was going to tell James is this is obviously a very intimate book for me to read because I walk the same streets, sometimes mm -hmm. go to the same pubs. I can name many of James's characters by name, which I won't do on a, in a, at this moment. Uh, but I wanted, um, I, I really loved, what I loved about the book was the segues James has oftentimes from a very intimate local Oxford setting and then he would he will widen the scope uh, and and really allow us to see Oxford as as uh, both a uh, both a very English city but also a world city in in some ways which is appropriate in a, in in writing about pandemic of course which is a global phenomenon as well as you know a, a, having a specific English um, form. I wanted to start by asking James about one such moment when he's with his friend Darren by the river and he sees that he, he sees one of those little houseboats, party boats go by. Um, and then there's a switch in register and then he suddenly recalls Conrad uh, as he looks at the river and he says, he thinks of that famous opening lines, oh, opening moments and heart of darkness. This too has been a place of darkness. Uh, and I wanted to ask James about what he was thinking uh, in terms of, you know, um, making that move uh, a very, very local Oxford scene that suddenly takes on quite dark, but also global um, undertones. So if I might invite James to sort of speak to that for a little, little yes, while. Yes. Um, I think, as you say, Oxford is a strange place because it's basically a, a sort of market town with a couple of universities and a car factory attached. Um, but yet it is globally connected in an extraordinary way. And it's also very cosmopolitan. Um, you know, the, the car factory doubled the population of Oxford between the wars. People came from all over the Commonwealth in the 50s and 60s um, to work in, in there and in associated industries. At the same time, academics and students are coming from all over the world to the university. People are coming to work in our hospitals and in the service industries. Um, lots of people from uh, the EU at least were living here because they were working in those industries and um, in the same way uh, I think the discussions that we have here resonate around the world and the river at that moment just struck me I mean I was talking to Darren who um, wasn't I this was my first meeting with Darren you know that conversation um, and um, we'd been talking about um, his experience uh, uh, as a child of the Windrush generation parents uh, living in Oxford. And um, suddenly that boat, boat went by and it sort of lifted our, our moods for a second as they sort of sailed off into the distance and they were all partying. But it just, I suddenly had that sense that that physical river joins us, not just to <coughs> but it, it's the same river that goes all the way to the the mouth of the Thames where Conrad's character sat on that yacht as the sun went down and um, you know Marlowe speaks begins his terrifying story really um, and he says that the river is is something that has served the inhabitants on its banks well but then he goes on to say that the conquest of the world is not a pretty sight, you know, by which he says he means taking it away from people with a different complexion or slightly flatter noses, that's the way he puts it, than us. It's not a, a pretty sight when you look into it too much. And I suppose that resonated with the discussion I've been having with Darren also about, you know, the statue of Cecil Rhodes, yeah. um, which of course is, um, live today with with uh, what's been in the news about academics protesting 
about its continued presence in the high street. And I think sometimes it's a mistake to think this is just something that concerns students and academics in the university because Darren was very clear that, I mean, he'd worked for three years uh, as a young man doing his catering A-level and so on. He'd worked in the, the kitchen at Oriel for three years without ever knowing there was a statue of Rhodes. And yet now he says, now he knows and we see you for who you are, he says to Rhodes. And we know you've been sapping the life from the inhabitants of this city. And that echoed very strongly for me um, words of John Acomfra, the artist, about Bristol and Colston, the Colston statue, and saying how, you know, these these objects have a sort of mystical, evil or unpleasant influence on on the area in which yeah. they're sited. And yeah. and Darren's real uh, anger was about that these his, this history is not taught. Far from erasing history, mm. uh, it's a question of actually teaching history and that I never knew there was a, a statue of Cecil Rhodes in the high street of the city that I live in until Rhodes Must Fall campaign began five or six years ago and so that that statue was teaching me nothing by being up there but since then it's taught me a lot because I've read Rhodes's writings and things like that and I've got a better idea of what kind of yeah. person he was. Um, yeah, so so those are the kind of things that made me think about the river as a physical symbol of that interconnectedness. I mean, I spoke to one uh, student who's been very involved in the Rosemans Fall campaign, and he told me that a, they'd had a letter from Canada from a primary school named after Cecil Rhodes, who had read about the campaign in Oxford, and they decided to change the name of their primary school. So that's what I mean, is we can't just imagine we're living in this isolated bubble because there are these global connections. Yeah, and, and I really, love, I mean, in a weird way, then the, then the virus, which is all about connectivities, the kind of connections that maybe you don't want, then allows you to think of Oxford as a city, not just the university, but the relationship between the city and the university. I, um, I, I really love that bit about your book and the second scene that what you've just said about people working in service industry, for example, the supermarkets that have often been written out really of the pandemic narrative. We don't hear, we hear the tragedies in the you know, care homes and the hospitals and so on. But that section you have about food chains uh, where you speak to one of the uh, guys who work in the supermarket. And I was really struck by that same kind of dynamic between interconnectivities, global, and then these local, very shrill kind of, um, uh, I suppose, disavowal of those interconnectivities. So this guy is talking about a, a, a packet of prawn that we buy that goes from Scotland to Thailand and back to UK for, uh, because the, you know, the Thai workers are supposed to be nimbler with their fingers, but actually it's because they get paid much less, etc. And they come back to Oxford and we, we, we go to the local supermarkets and then then these guys are coming face to face with people who are anxious about the virus, about being too close or etc. from the yeah, people. It's a very weird, I think, you know, the government slogan was, if you can work at home, stay at home. Yeah. But by definition, most kind of working class jobs, you can't do that. Yeah. And um, I think the sense that this man I was talking to who worked in the supermarket had was almost as if he and his colleagues were living in a different world to everybody else and people would queue in an orderly fashion outside supermarket but once they came in they'd come up close and ask questions and even touch people the union representative was saying and um you know these people were expected to carry on functioning and then of course there was the famous case of um one of the early fatalities um, from COVID in the UK was a woman who um, was working in a, a food processing plant and her employers didn't provide um, proper sick pay to people who got COVID. They, they just told people that they could have the statutory sick pay of £95 a week. And for a lot of people, £90 a week might be their rent 
they've got dependents. There's no way they can do that. So this particular woman, uh, even though she had symptoms, she felt terrible, she felt compelled to come back to work and stand on a production line side by side with mm -hmm. her colleagues. She died. And many people in that um, uh, mm -hmm. outfit uh, contracted coronavirus. But it, it shows the sort of interconnectedness of all these these things i think mm, mm. Very, very, yeah, yeah. Uh, and what what you you also spoke to uh, uh, there's another moment where you speak to two very different ladies don't you you speak oh, yeah. to a professional historian and you also speak to a woman who complains really about about why rule Brit songs like rule britannia etc have uh, she feels become slightly not quite um uh, banned but taboo almost uncomfortable to sing so it uh, I, what I what I found in your book was really interesting was this I suppose relationship between closeness and distance how people are having to reappraise their own sense of who they are which city they belong to which country they belong to what, what kind of world they belong to and that struck me as something that's really the virus that's allowed or forced people to do that you capture um, brilliantly, if I say so myself, uh, <laughs> um, and I really, I really enjoyed that. But I know we have a big conversation coming up, or a, a wider conversation coming up about this. So I might go back to Marina and start our roundtable chat. Um, well, I think that one of the things that is, if considering it's not a very long book, I think mm -hmm. you, people will have already realised that it's a very, very richly layered book. And actually one of the other stories that it tells that in a way mirrors your national, your story about place and belonging and internationalism mm. is the evolution of relationships to the hope that the rainbow represented told through the account of people's changing feelings about the clapping. I mean, James, is, the book is very trenchant about our political masters. I mean, wonderfully, wonderfully unflinchingly critical. And, and this story of how people began to realize that something, you know, we were being had in a way by being, I mean, the NH, you, you tell the story, James. Yes, well, um, you know, I think we all remember when uh, the idea came first arose that on a Thursday evening we should clap for the NHS. And I think a lot of people's, uh, experience was um, that to start with that was a very positive thing yeah. to do we wanted to show appreciation and um, you know just honor those um, you know who were working so hard for us um, but I think after a couple of weeks and and beginning to realize that many NHS workers were very conflicted about this um, and about language, about heroes and so on. I mean, you know, as the nurse says, that's that's just what we do. We do, that's what we do. If I get a call um, that needs me up at the hospital in five minutes because there's been a major incident, I'll be on my bike and I'll get there. You know, that's what we do. And um, they didn't want, uh, they didn't want clapping really. They wanted perhaps, um, uh, further funding and, and, and possibly yeah. uh, recognition through fair pay and, and things like that. And uh, there was also a sense that once you saw politicians uh, standing outside their dwellings clapping that, okay, this has become a kind of smokescreen. And at the same time, the NHS brand, in a sense, was being put on privatised activities that were catastrophically uh, not useful or, or not, not functioning properly, uh, allowing people to make money out of things, um, but branding them, you know, NHS track and trace, for instance. Um, so, so I think there was, there was manipulation going, there, going on there. And I think there was, um, gradually, I just sort of noticed this sort of increasing discomfort with all of that. And you also capture, you know, the, the, I mean, the fact that the, the problem about deception in the public sphere, conducted by authorities, is that it undermines people's trust in all discourse. And you actually, you know, come across some extremely vivid um, spokespeople for anti-vax and so forth. 
Mm. I mean, one of the things I really wanted to do uh, in the book, if I could, was to get outside the bubble of people who have opinions much like my own, you know, I mean, because how boring is that at the end of the day? Um, much more interesting if you're going on a sort of journey of this kind to have encounters with people who think differently to you. I mean, Montaigne, I think, says in his travel journal something like, it, you know, mixing with, mixing with the world rubs and polishes your brain. You know, I think we all sort of missed that when we were locked in our houses, just that kind of back and forth with people who have slightly different opinions to you. And I mean, in the case of the anti-vaxxers, um, I guess, uh, you know, I didn't have an awful lot of sympathy with what they were saying, but I think I kind of believe in in face-to-face -face human conversation rather than um, interchanges on the internet, just because when you're in somebody's physical presence, it's much easier to engage with them as another human being and perhaps feel why they see things differently to you. But yes, they were they were interesting people. I mean, Pablo, do you want to jump in? I know. Oh, I was just I was just saying that's that's the only moment I've, I mean, normally you're a very patient and curious listener. <laughs> And that's the only moment in the book where I've sensed a little bit of discomfort on your part or how you're portraying yourself when yeah. you're listening to the 5G conspiracies and the anti-vaxxers, etc. And I was just wondering what, what your, um, I mean, in a sense, what Marina was just saying you know, a moment ago about trust, a lot of what they're saying you, you hear in a general, really deeply felt uh, hurt in, in, in our public sphere about mistrust and a lack of trust. So for example, uh, the woman who keeps on going about crony capitalism, et cetera, a lot of their analysis of why we shouldn't trust the, you know, the, what they call the COVID narrative in, in a sense has a wider resonance, right? And then it, and then it falls back into a kind of, you know, quite specific um, uh, uh, sort of conspiracy theories, et cetera. I was wondering what you meant, because was your discomfort uh, um, to do with the fact that you recognize some of what you're saying and maybe even find yourself in what they were saying in, in terms of mistrust and then find yourself to be suddenly thrown, thrown, thrown back by the other half of the conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, the historian actually pointed out that you can hear slogans from one source and agree with them and believe them. And then when you hear them from another source, you're skeptical about them. And so I do point out that much of the language that she, that, that particular woman used about crony capitalism and billionaires profiting uh, and so on could equally have come from, from a left-wing source. Um, but, you know- Or from yourself, right? Oh, oh, yeah, it could, yeah, exactly. Or any yeah. of us, I think. Uh, one, yeah, but um, yes, so that, that does make it difficult to sort of navigate yeah. uh, your way through these things. And also, um, I think I'm obviously sympathetic to people who, for historical reasons, have a distrust of, you know, stuff coming from the government towards them. Um, you know, there might be many reasons for that. Um, but... I, I think, yeah, I, I think perhaps I allowed, I mean, consciously, I allowed my slight impatience to show at that point. But you went uh, back to her, didn't you? I you, did you, go back. I mean, I sort of, You kind of fled and then you decided you must listen to her. Yeah, I did. I, I went back okay. and I listened and I'm, I'm glad I did, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> the other, the, though, though, in a way, the unpeeling of these layers it gives a very sad story. I mean, it's, it's, you know, not only the desolation of the pandemic itself, but also all these points of disillusion and estrangement that seems to have happened. The actual buoyancy of the book rises towards the end. I mean, in, in that people have spoken to you, you have spoken to them, listened to them. And then you actually ask, you quote Thomas Brown saying, you know, is there a way to build a novel Britannia? Mm. I think that's yeah. what you say. I mean, yeah. I do. Do you feel have... there's some hope? Just, do you feel there's some hope? Yeah. Um, well, I feeling I've got a feeling that we've kind of somehow got to come to understand 
other people's opinions. And I mean, what struck me, Pablo, something that you alluded to with the, with the two different women, the historian and the the um, VE Day enthusiast who wanted to be allowed to sing Rule Britannia because she said she grew up in the war and it was about Britons never being slaves, being taken over by, she didn't see it as being about in the trade of enslaved people. She saw it as about, mm -hmm. you know, being safe from invasion. Um, but uh, I, I think something else that we've touched on, you know, Pablo, when we've chatted is the sort of slippery nature of terms like Britishness and, yeah. and English and, and so on. And I think the problem is that we've become very polarized and people have got a very different idea of what these terms now mean. And of course, we're living at a time when the union might be anyway coming to an end in the, in the, in the form that we now um, understand it. Um, but at some point, we're gonna to have to come to a sort of agreement about, well, what is, what do we think our country is and what, what it means and what can we kind of gather around that we agree on or, because there's a certain mold of politics that we've seen in America recently that just is based on perpetual division and stoking up those divisions. But I think eventually, I mean, my hope is that people get exhausted by that and they then look for something else. And, and so, you know, we've got to have some hope. But I think it is it is sort of down to us to somehow find a way of having a dialogue with people that don't have the same opinions as ourselves. I mean, there's a, there's a great moment. I think, but but uh, Marina raised the question of hope. I mean, for me, the book was is actually full of hope, and it comes out in very little moments. For example, I'm thinking of uh, the redoubtable pub land, landlady who's facing mm. you. But as she's facing you, out of the corner of her eye, she can see the, a van being parked in the space of the binman, and she runs out and, and chases the van away because she says it's very important to keep the bin men on side, right? So what yeah. you what you have is this uh, A extraordinary society. Yes, who, who who she she knows the value people bring, such as bin men, to her own lives, and she's hawk-eyed and eagle-eyed about about protecting that kind of alliance. And yeah. I found the book full of alliances of of that sort. And mm -hmm. perhaps for me, the greatest. Um, hope out of the book is how resilient people have been despite everything to preserve and fight for those alliances and I found that I mean partly because obviously I know the pub and I recognize the landlady I thought I, I thought that was a great example of small hopes small acts of hope absolutely lighting the candle did you yeah. quote the taper is that you lighting the taper and passing the taper I don't think it's me. Oh, yes, it's, it's an idea that you know you have you light a candle, you can light another candle, but you, it doesn't diminish your your light. Yeah. Passing it on. Hmm. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. The sort of the strength and resilience of of some of the characters I talk to, um, and their openness um, about what they've been through, is extraordinary. And you know, for obvious reasons, I, I sort of said to everybody, it's fine if you want to be anonymous. And most people chose to follow that. But there was one particular person um, who got back to me. Um, and it's, it's quite nerve wracking uh, writing about where you live. Because, yeah. of course, people will ag agree to be... Um, you know, recorded and interviewed and, and it's going to be in a book. But sometimes I was just worried that people, when they actually saw it on the page, would feel... Come and knock on your door. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, one particular person said to me that it started a conversation in their family because uh, their parents hadn't known quite how distressing it had been for them during the pandemic. But um, when they saw the book, they thought, right, I've got to have that conversation. Uh, and they sent the book to their parent and, and had that conversation. And that sort of moved something forward. And other people have said that it's been a way of processing 
things sort of happened. I mean, the the fantastic um, nurse who, when I spoke to her, I, I managed to get a time when she wasn't on shift. She was just like, sit there. And she just sort of spoke in an unbroken way so powerfully. And um, she she read the book and she was very positive, but she actually gave me an update um, in the last couple of days where she said the first wave, she'd worked through the second wave as well, which was in January and February. And she said the first wave that she describes in the book, which made her so angry the way things were happening. She said second wave made the first wave look like a picnic. She said oh. in the first wave, we saved more than we lost. In the oh. second wave, it was the other other way round but she said strangely reading her own words she realized how angry she'd been and she said now she's almost calm and resigned because just determined to live her life to the full because she'd seen so many people whose lives had been ended mm. uh, before they could do the things they'd been wanting to do and you know I, I find I found these people extraordinary I also found uh, the young woman I spoke to about um, Extinction Rebellion, um, who was 13 at the time, yeah. and who was undertaking um, various actions mm -hmm. and um, getting time off school before, before school was closed, of course, to do things. Um, I found her testimony very powerful mm -hmm. um, because I was just so conscious listening to her talk of the sort of weight that her generation are carrying yeah. of the stuff that we've landed them with yeah. really. And um, there was a moment when I just said, how does it feel? How does that feel? And, and she said, well, it's strange because I was asked about what GCSEs I'm gonna be doing next year. And I just thought, well, there's not much point about thinking about the future because I might not have much future anyway, unless we, stop what we're doing and I, I just found that so powerful to hear from this young person who was also so determined to make a change and I think those things are incredibly hopeful yeah really yeah. I want to ask you something because your, your last book or perhaps not your only last book but uh, it was Guernica yeah about, about the famous painting and that that's sort of permanent whereas this is about impermanent art and I wanted, I wanted to ask you if you feel that it's a good idea to move towards permanence. I mean, your book is a permanent work in a way, of the sort of equivalent. Um, but would it be a, an idea, for example, to, to, to actually try to have a, a kind of a, a, a statement, a, a kind of pandemic? Should we commission something? I mean, not, not necessarily a statue. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe something like what's the back of your your on the back of your screen you know sort of a map that would kind of capture experience of the I mean I'm, I'm not, actually the, my main question is between the ephemeral nature of the rainbows and the idea of the permanent masterwork like the Guernica. Yes. I, you've you've thrown a, you've thrown me a question that has slightly floored me there, Marina. I'm I'm not sure what what form that will take, and, and maybe it will just be in multiple novels and poetry and artworks <laughs> and and books uh, that come out of it. And 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 you know, I'm just not sure. I mean, I know that people have been collecting people's testimonies and, and all of this kind of thing. I think various museums have been at work in this way, but uh, yeah, I, I can't, nothing springs to mind. I mean, on the subject of statues, um, I, it, it did occur to me that just returning briefly to um, Cecil uh, and his statue and, and the idea that it was so expensive to take it down and what would we do? I just thought um, one could detoxify the legacy, which is now being used for positive things, the finances and so on, um, by remembering, you know, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation and the fact that, that Mandela sort of agreed 
to have his name alongside Cecil Rhodes, knowing full well uh, that le- what that legacy is, um, in a sort of positive um, frame of mind that you can't have, um, you know, you can't have reconciliation without reparation and truth. <laughs> but I thought, why not commission um, uh, an artist of African descent um, to make a statue of Nelson Mandela and put that in the place of Cecil Rhodes. And you would still be honoring the work of the Rhodes Trust and the um, Mandela. Yeah, I think, yes, I, mean, I, I think it's disingenuous to say it's too expensive to take down because they could just screen it and shroud it mm. with another artwork. I anyway. mean, there's yeah. many other people uh, thinking and talking about that, I guess. Yeah. But. Actually, if I, if, I know Wes is about to jump in. Marina's question is very, very interesting about, about you know, the statuesque and the ephemeral. And, and just the, no. the two, two blocks down from me, there's a street. And one of the interesting thing about this art has been it has a year to change and, 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 yeah. and disappear and reappear. Mm-hmm. Um, just a two blocks down from me, there's a street which has now become almost a semi-permanent display of art of all kinds related to pandemics, rainbows, but also to do with schools, to do with just just people's daily responses of a two-year pandemic. And that's, you know, it changes. It's not the same thing. Things get taken down, things get put up. It seems to me a splendid example of what public art can be that is not statuesque. That's, that's not monolithic community. in a sense. So it's a very interesting point. Yeah, a community that's been energized and brought together yeah. by the yeah. situ- shared experience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to stop this amazing discussion. It's really very, very enjoyable and really um, kind of insightful on so many levels. But I suppose, well, it is partly my job to bring in questions. Um, oh, and yeah. one, one is to do with, um, it, in a sense, you've already addressed it, but I'd like to come back to it. And that's the question of how much is this book, a book about the first lockdown? Um, how much is it, in a sense, therefore, already about a time that we're not living in anymore? Um, and indeed, you, James, you mentioned that, that, that the nurse in particular came back to you and said, actually, look, this isn't like it was. Um, and I wondered, you know, um, do you now need to write another one about now, uh, about the second uh, lockdown, about the third lockdown? I mean, in, in other words, um, is this about a particular time that's actually already historical on some level? Well, the weird thing is that so many of the things that people talked about in the, you know, at that point um, are now being played out in, in current political debates mm-hmm. and, and questions. And I, I, it still feels very sort of topical to me. And um I think in one sense, it's like a bubble in the Arctic ice that scientists can find and release, you know, and and feel what was the air like at that time. I mean, I I sort of try and locate it in time between the spring and the autumn equinox of last year. But of course, I was proofs were still going back and forth till December or something. And there was time to tweak a few little things. But I think the issues that are raised are, are beyond uh, that particular moment. Very yeah, no, I really, uh, let, let me be clear. I really didn't mean to, to, to no, say, no. look, its moment has gone. It was more really? a question. Uh, it's partly about that thing about how one of the things you trace so powerfully is the sort of instrumentalization of hope or the instrumentalization of a particular symbol that then becomes used by other people in ways that are both positive and negative across, across the book. Um, and I think um, I think what the person's asking is, you know, um, what's happened to the hope that people had at the beginning? Have we had to lose that or is there a new kind of hope now? Um, and so on. So it's yeah, it, it, it's about how do you sustain that hope over time um, when when we've been through in a sense, we've been through this before, but we also haven't because it's different uh, each time. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, another one of the. Um, the questions is is about this sort of statue question um and somebody suggests that um uh, and this is actually very nice obviously somebody who's a regular for torch um suggests that we might all go and see samson kambalu's exhibition in modern art oxford i don't know if you have already um, yeah, yeah. 
but where one of the things is precisely a sort of the, the elephants made of MA gowns. Um, uh, uh, and as, as I mentioned in the con conversation we had with Samson, it would be very nice to parade those elephants up and down the high street, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I mean, clearly, but in a sense, that's that's more the question about distributing whatever public art is across a name, a number of different spaces, rather than necessarily monumentalizing it in, in one moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're all nodding sagely at that. Do you, do you want to go? Do you want to say more about that, James, or is, is that enough? Um, I, I, I don't know. What about you, Marina? I mean, I think, yeah. Um, in a sense, the discussions about statues that we're having are a sort of warning about attempting to create a permanent historical yeah. artifact that will yeah. resonate down the generations in the same way. Um, you know, and, and you, give, you, you give an example of the monument to the Great Fire of London and how yeah. it kept yeah. being the inscription keeps being changed. Yeah. And actually, the Beckett exhibition at the at the moment at the British Museum, first exhibition I went to since, um, <laughs> tells you that tells this absolutely cataclysmic story in which at one moment he's people are drinking his blood in order to be cured of leprosy, because he's such a major underworking saint. And then 200 years later or 300 years later, he's expunged from the annals. <laughs> you know, kind of dis I mean, his, his relics are smashed, the Canterbury is destroyed. <laughs> he's not to be mentioned. So, so these historical vicissitudes do point to not trying to make permanent truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, uh, and the monument in London, you know, was erected um, in memorial of the Great Fire. And then... Um, a conspiracy theory <laughs> came along that the fire had been started by papist plotters mm -hmm. and so a sentence was added to say that um you know that it was all their fault and it was taken off and then it was put on again and it stayed there until the 1830s um accusing the uh, catholics of having lit the fire of mm -hmm. london mm -hmm. and I wondered if those who argue against the erasure of history would think that it should still be there. Of course, it's been removed now in the 19th century it was removed. But would those same people say, oh, you mustn't remove it because yes. that's amazing <laughs> history. And, and it's fine yeah. to make all the Catholic people in London feel slightly terrified and, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> Mm. But it's also a peculiar vision of history, isn't it? Because as you yourself said, you, you've lived in Oxford all your life till, or a large part of your life, and only a few years ago you became aware of Cecil Rhodes' statue. So uh, the equation of statues with history is a very odd gesture, <laughs> I think. Um, I, I think the message of some of the people uh, that I spoke to is what hurts is not telling history yeah. rather than, yep. than, you know, and... and it, there's, by taking statues down and putting them in museums and recontextualizing them, then you really, you tell people, you know, you tell, teach people about history. And, and a lot of us, you know, I, I lived in London for a long time and, you know, you walk around, there's statues all over the place. And unless you're really looking, you don't even think, who was that? You know, it's just some bloke on a horse, you know. Um, I've got one more question, yeah. which is um, about the title. Um, and the question is, um, why under rather than over? <laughs> um, I guess, you know, it was a little pun on the on yep. the song over the rainbow, but uh, it was it was sort of alluding to a feeling that we were somehow all living beneath this sign. It was kind of omnipresent. And um, yeah, so that's that's. I suppose if, if I'm interpreting the question, it's partly again about hope. The song Over the Rainbow is a song about hope and about somewhere, some other world that, yeah. that might exist. And and obviously the whole question of, you know, what's at the, what's at the end of the rainbow and so on. Um, mm. uh, and I suppose, yeah, the, the, that you're right, that, that the, or the question is right and your response is right, that under gives a sense of, of, of a sort of constrained, a constrained living. Um, but nonetheless, with some measure of, of hope in it. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because the, the traditional drawing, the one that uh, James has recorded, mm -hmm. is not the usual semi-arc no. that lead, leads up to heaven, a sort of celestial sign. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an arch, it's a hoop, it comes back to earth. 
Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, it is a slightly different rainbow from what one usually, I mean, I've hardly ever seen a rainbow that touches at both ends. I think mm. I've seen one once. Mm. Yep, yep. Um, we're running out of time now, sadly, um, but I just want to um, thank everybody uh, present. So uh, Marina, Pablo, James, everybody listening and watching online and who'll catch up online. Um, that's part of the strange world we live in now is that things happen at, at different paces whilst also live. Um, but really just thank you so much um, for, well, James, first of all, for writing the book. <laughs> um, um, uh, and uh, yeah, absolutely. And then uh, Pablo and Marina for responding so warmly and generously. Thank, and with you, such... thank, thank you all three. It's really been great. Yeah, thank it's you. a pleasure. Yeah. Um, and um, to thank uh, our, our listeners, watchers uh, for being here, to thank the backstage team, Maya and, to uh, Maya and uh, Holly in Torch, for making this possible. And then before everybody leaves, just to say, our next event um, is uh, Thursday, the 24th of June, so in two weeks' time, where one more time this term we have another uh, Big Tent live event before the summer break, um, and then we'll, be, we'll welcome award-winning poet, lyricist, musician, etc., and activist Benjamin Zephaniah at uh, 5 p.m. for this time a live discussion. So we will actually be in a room. Um, we will be in discussion in collaboration with the Art in Action and the Postcolonial Writers Make Worlds Project the Faculty of English will be coming to you live from the Story Museum. Um, so uh, some of us at least will be live, others can be watching at home. Um, but for now, um, thanks once again to all three of you um, and to uh, thank you so much and um, have a good rest of an evening. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.